Hi, Dr. Marcia Tuft here. Today, I'm going to take you on a math adventure to look at the science behind how our catapults work. But don't worry, I'm going to do all the heavy lifting for you. So if you've been with me so far, you've built a cardboard catapult using a stir stick, a cardboard box, a pencil, condiment cup, a little clip, and a rubber band. This rubber band stores the potential energy of our catapult. And when I connect it to my lever arm with my little hook here, I go from an extended position where I'm storing the potential energy to a release position with a lot less extension. And I am going to load some sort of a projectile in there that's gonna take that potential energy and convert it into kinetic energy and move. So we're gonna get some distance out of this. But how do catapults work? How can we tune it? And what could we measure? What would we wanna measure if we could? Okay, so today I wanna to talk about the geometry of catapults. And I wanna walk you through a math adventure uh, where I'm gonna derive some equations and show you what drives distance and some different factors that you can influence to get more range or less range, depending on what you need. Okay, so the key parts of a catapult are, we've got our lever arm, which you see in green here. And at the bottom you see that's the rest position where we're stretching that rubber band as much as we can. We're putting as much energy as we can into that, to that rubber band, storing energy. And then when we let go, it releases and it hits this anchor or stop point. So our frame, which you can see in purple, basically exists to give us a pivot point for our lever arm and a stop point where we release our projectile. Now my catapult designs give you the opportunity to put multiple stops in. So you can have multiple lever arm positions and we're gonna explore and see what all we can do with this design to give us even more flexibility with our range. Okay, so the two main things our frame has to do, it's got to provide a pivot point for our catapult lever arm, and it has to provide a stopping point so that we will release our projectile, okay? Now here, if you look at the bottom here, you can see I've sketched in my rubber band at the initial starting position, and I'm calling that elongation E1. And then at the stop position, the release position, I'm calling that elongation E2. Okay, so that's really important to keep track of how much elongation. So your angle of your rubber band is going to change, but it's the total elongation, the difference between E1 and E2, that's going to tell us how much potential energy was stored and released. Okay, so our catapult lever arm is going to turn through this angle beta. And if you haven't had trig or um, trigonometry yet, um, don't worry, some of this may go over your head. Just let it flow. Know that math is incredibly relevant to science and engineering. And if you can stick with me, Hopefully you'll get some insights that you'll be able to use to improve your catapult game, okay? So basically this angle beta here is the same as this angle beta here. I won't go why that is, okay? But I'm making a 90 degree angle here with my velocity vector at release. It's gonna act perpendicular to my lever arm. So my launch angle alpha is actually gonna be equal to 90 minus beta. Just take my word for it. Your math teacher will do the proofs when you get to trig and geometry, okay? But this, this launch angle alpha is gonna be really important because that's gonna determine how much of the total velocity is converted into horizontal velocity and how much is converted into vertical velocity. So using the power of trigonometry and angles, all I need to know is my total velocity and the angle, and I can extract 
a horizontal component and a vertical component. That's going to be really useful because I've got equations that I want to work with separately on the vertical component of velocity and distance and the horizontal component of distance and velocity. Okay, and of course I'm going to have my projectile here and because it's a mass, gravity is going to act on it with a constant acceleration downwards equal to the gravitational constant g. Okay, so that's what's going on with my catapult system. Let's look at potential energy for a minute. I already mentioned the elongation of my rubber band. I can look at the change in potential energy. And engineers and mathematicians, we like to use Greek symbols for some of our notation. And the big triangle, that means delta. That's the Greek symbol for delta, and that means change. So the delta PE means the change in potential energy. That's going to be equal to my spring constant K times the change in elongation, or E1 minus E2. And I'm going to square that because energy is a function of force times a distance. OK. And I'm going to write that as k delta e squared, because I like those funky triangles. Don't stress. Now, that's, that change in potential energy is going to get converted into kinetic energy of this projectile. And kinetic energy is roughly 1 half mv squared. Now, to be honest, we got a lot going on with our catapults. We are moving this lever arm. You know, there might be a little friction with how I duct tape my lever arm in there. So it may be more complicated than I'm explaining, but I'm an engineer. No worries. I'm going to make an assumption and I'm going to see what insights I can get from simplifying my problem to say, OK, there may be more mass than just this projectile ball that I have to worry about, but all I care about is the velocity that's transferred into this projectile. OK? And I can test. I can do some tests to figure out if I'm in the ballpark and, and if what I'm assuming makes sense. So don't stress. We can test. So the other piece I need to um, talk about a little bit is a coordinate system. We always need to have a clear coordinate system. And there's two things that I need to be really, really clear about. The distance x that I'm, I can calculate with the equations I'm going to derive are going to start from the initial release point of my projectile, which is actually going to be in my condiment cup. So wherever my stop is for this system, that's where I need to measure my x and my y from. So if I just drop a vertical line from the center of my condiment cup, That'll tell me about where I should start measuring my x distance, my horizontal distance. And I want to know the vertical offset too. So the vertical offset is y0. So that's my initial height at launch. And this x offset, I'm going to measure that too. But it's a lot easier for me to measure a distance from the front of my catapult so when I set up my measuring tape, I always do it from the front of the catapult. And then I just add that offset in there so I can get the total distance. It will give me a little bit more accurate results if I'm trying to model the physics of what's really going on. OK, so now we've got our coordinate system. What can we do? OK, let's go back and simplify and look at our ball. OK, so here we've got our projectile. What, what are the forces acting on it? Well, we've got velocity. We've got some sort of total velocity v that acts at an angle alpha from horizontal. And I can um, basically split that into a horizontal component and a vertical component. It's going to make it a lot easier for me to work with this. Um, my horizontal component I can calculate as v, the total velocity, times the cosine of alpha. And the vertical component is going to be v, my total velocity, times the sine of alpha. And you probably haven't had trigonometry yet. Don't stress. It just means if I know alpha and my total velocity, 
I can calculate the horizontal and vertical components. That's all you need to know. And don't forget, I've also got gravity acting on this mass too. So I got to remember that it's going to affect my uh, X and Y positions. Okay, how? Let's take a look. Now I know that distance equals velocity times time. And in particular, my X distance is a function of the X component of velocity, Vx, times the time. Okay, what time? Well, the total distance is going to be Vx times the time to fall. How do I calculate that? How do I find that out? Well, if you look at my y equation here, I've given you the equation for the vertical position of my projectile. And that's going to be equal to my initial offset height, y0. Okay, to that, I'm climbing vy times time. So for every increment of time multiplied by my vertical component of velocity, that's going to give me additional height. But then I've got to subtract off the acceleration due to gravity. And that component is this 1 half gt squared. And that's going to be minus. OK, so if you've had some algebra, you might recognize this as a quadratic equation. So if I set y equal to 0, now I can solve for t. How do I do that? Well, this is the solution to the quadratic equation. So t is going to be equal to vy, my vertical component of velocity, plus or minus, because I've got two, two roots here. So I've got to look, I've got to calculate both roots. And the first, the first root, um, plus or minus, the square root of my vertical velocity squared, vy squared, plus 2gy0, where g is my gravitational constant, uh, converted to the same units that I'm using for my other measurements. Okay, so you got to have consistent units here. You take all of that and divide by g. Okay, so we don't actually have to solve for this to get some useful information. So if I look at this, how do I increase the time to fall? Well, if I increase the vertical component of my velocity, that's going to increase time. So I can say t fall here increases as vy increases, but also as y0, so my offset. So if I want to get more hang time, I could prop my catapult up on a box or a stack of books. So that's another way that I could increase my hang time. OK, so you see where I'm headed with these equations? You only have to solve. But I can show you how you can interpret what we get out of it to see how we can tune our range and get longer distance or shorter distance if we're overshooting. OK, what next? Well, let's look at our energy. OK, so we already talked our change in potential energy is equal to k times the change in our elongation squared. That's the energy stored in our rubber band. But that also equals the change in kinetic energy to our projectile. So we're going to say that's equal to 1 half mv squared. If I set both sides of the equation equal, I get 1 half mv squared equals k delta e squared k is my spring constant. If I solve for v, rearrange the terms, I get v on the left, I get v equal to the square root of 2km, so it's 2 times the spring constant divided by the mass of my projectile, times the change in elongation. Well, what does that mean? It means quite a lot, actually. It means that we can increase velocity by decreasing the mass. So if I hold um, everything constant except mass and I decrease the mass, the velocity will go up. Um, or if I hold everything constant and increase my spring constant, k, my velocity will go up. Or if I increase the elongation of my rubber band, 
I can get my velocity to go up. So anything in the numerator of my equation, if I increase it, it will increase my velocity. Anything that's in the denominator of my equation, if I increase that, my velocity will decrease. So mass, as mass increases, velocity decreases, or if I decrease my mass, my velocity will increase. Got it? So here, think of this as your crib sheet. What you can change if you need to get a longer distance. Okay, so I can either change my lever arm angle to increase my vertical velocity to get bigger hang time. Or I can increase my height to get more hang time. But if I want to just get more velocity, I can change my mass. I can change my spring cost. How would I do that? Well, I could either add a second rubber band that would change my spring constant, or maybe I can find a stiffer rubber band. So those are some ways that I can change my spring constant K. My elongation E would be, where do I position my stop point along here? So is there another place along this angle where I can change the amount of potential energy stored. That might be another way that we can try. So you see, there's so much we can learn from these equations that will help us model our catapults or maybe even design a better catapult next time. Um, I'm using these equations to calculate my pro projectile trajectory. So I'm using these equations, x equals vx times t, y equals y0 plus vyt minus one half gt squared. And you can see I've also solved for my time to fall. Now, if I look at my lever arm position one, that's a launch angle of 21 degrees. That's this gray line right here. Okay, I had the longest horizontal velocity of any of these three conditions because I'm putting most of that energy into horizontal velocity. You think that would give me the best distance, right? But for this setup, the hang time wasn't long enough to get me very far. So I only made it 45 inches in this case. Okay. Now, if I look at lever arm position five, that's this yellow symbols, yellow line. Okay. I got lots of hang time. I got the longest hang time of all three cases. But I spent so much energy into vertical velocity, I didn't have enough horizontal velocity to get it very far. So even though I had not quite twice the amount of hang time as lever arm position one, it actually went a little bit um, less far. So a little bit shorter distance. So can you see the effect of your lever arm your launch angle on your total distance. And finally, lever arm position three. So for this catapult, it's this, this middle position here. That got me the furthest distance of all three because I had enough horizontal velocity to get me further and I had enough vertical velocity to get me that extra hang time. So can you see how the hang time helps with, you know, horizontal distance traveled. And now I'm going to show you the impact of uh, vertical offset. Okay, so if you remember what we had before, 51 to 52, 45 to 45, 43 to 45, not much difference. We're still getting the most distance with lever arm position three. Okay, so we didn't make much of a change between the offsets we had in the last chart and this one. But what if we could increase that distance from 10 inches to 25 inches? Would that make a difference? Let's take a look. So here we've got an H0 of 25 inches, and I've just pasted in the table for H0 equals 10 inches to the right, so we can compare the results really easily. Okay, so for lever arm position one, we gained 15 inches of distance. So that additional hang time from, from 0.377 seconds 
to 0.499, almost half a second, that got me 15 inches. That's huge. So a little bit of extra hang time with a lot of horizontal velocity got me a lot further. Okay, for our middle angle, condition three, it got me 10 inches further. And for our, our um, steepest angle, 57, lever arm position five, got me from 45 to 52, so it got me seven inches. Okay, so the steeper, the steeper the angle, the less impact it had because your horizontal velocity is smaller. So these are some of the trade-offs we can do with a math model to see what's the sweet spot for tuning. So there are a lot of different ways to measure velocity, but one of the traditional ways and the way I used it for my uh, PhD dissertation and the high-speed uh, single particle impact test was high-speed photography. Basically what that meant was getting a series of still images at a certain amount of uh, time apart. So we know that distance equals velocity times time. So with high-speed photography, we can figure out how much the projectile is moving through each frame. We know how much time is between the individual frames, then we can calculate the velocity. Okay, so what's the cheap, easy, modern equivalent for that? It's called video. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, some sort of smartphone with a video option, you can actually record the video of your projectile, but you need a background grid to project the motion across. So here's a picture of my frame without the projectile. And I've just added a little sketch at the bottom. Um, what I did in this case is I actually shot the video, then I extracted still images of each of the frames with the projectile moving through, and then I imported it into Adobe Sketch on my iPad. And I put each frame into a separate layer, and I just let it come into the default position so that they would all line up on each other. Then I took a new layer and drew a circle to approximate where the start of each projectile was in each frame. So here's my first frame. And this is motion blur. So unless you're shooting with very high speed film or a very fast frame rate and a lot of light, you're likely to get motion blur. That's okay. All you need to do is uh, figure out where the projectile is and mark it. So here, what I did is I traced a circle over it. And in this case, I added my, my circles onto the same layer. So I'm gonna show you all the circles that I traced. And I'll show you each frame by frame. So this was my first freeze frame. And this is where I estimated my ball position was. This was the second frame, third, fourth, and fifth. Okay, so now I have my background and I have my balls identified against my background grid. So what do you do from here? Well, you could try to estimate and say, oh, this looks like it's two point something inches, uh, not quite, maybe not quite four inches measuring from here to here. You could try and eyeball it. But what I did is I printed it out on paper and then measured it. So basically I identified the same spot in each image and measured that with a ruler. Okay, so I've got, I've got a scale factor I have to account for here and I'm gonna walk you through that. So given I've got a two inch grid, the video was shot at 30 frames per second. When I printed this out on paper and measured it, this two inch grid here, this two inch distance, I measured at 7 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, so that's my scale factor to get from paper measurement to real measurements. Okay, and I, would, I did a great job of lining up my circles 
against my projectiles because I got 15 sixteenths of an inch for each of these. So I really got very consistent results. The velocity, the total velocity is going to be the same, but the horizontal and vertical components will change as gravity um, decelerates the vertical velocity. Doesn't matter. We're just looking for total velocity. Okay, so how do I calculate velocity? Well, I start V equals 15 sixteenths of an inch measured. Okay, now I multiply that by my conversion factor, which is two inches in real measurements divided by 7 16 inches measured. So I'm calling my measured paper measurements inches measured. And I'm keeping my units with me so that I make sure I'm ending up with the right um, units at the end. And then I multiply that by 30 frames per second to get me the correct time scale. So I want to end up inches per second. OK, so I can cross off the 16th, the 16th canceled with the 7 16th here. My inches measurements cancels out. So I end up with velocity equals 15 times 2 times 30 divided by 7 inches per second. And that came out to be like 128.6. And I just rounded off to um, an even number, 129 inches per second. Close enough. So that's how you can measure velocity. As I said, it's a lot of work may not be worth the effort, but that's a way that you can check and make sure that the physics is making sense. And when I actually did this and I calculated my time to fall, um, I got my total X distance um, what was very close to what I measured from subsequent um, catapult tests. So I'm, that's another way you can use to check and make sure you got your unit straight. Just do a test and make sure that you're coming out with uh, from your equations that you're getting the right uh, horizontal distance. OK, so I've taken you through the geometry of catapults, the science behind it. We've seen how that we can trade off velocity by changing our mass, changing our spring constant, and changing our spring elongation, all things that we can do to change the velocity that goes into a projectile. And then we can trade off um, how far it goes um, vertically. We can tune that further with launch angle. So what should we do next? And how can we use what we learned? Well, for next time, I'd like you to take a selection of three different projectiles. By this, I mean three different weights. So you can do some tests to figure out what works well over your range of launch angles, but pick three launch angles and pick three projectiles. Okay, so you're going to have nine different test conditions. And why three different projectiles? Well, if we saw velocity as a function of the square root of the mass, so we're not going to have a linear relationship between mass and velocity. So I want to get at least three different data points to help me figure out what that curve looks like. And I'd like, you know, a lighter and a heavier and something in the middle. So you want your masses, um, you want a, a nice distribution between your three, your three weights for your projectile. Okay, so three projectiles, meaning three different weights and three launch angles. That's going to be nine different test conditions. So for each test condition, repeat the test five to 10 times and record the data, the total distance traveled. So if you measure from the front of your catapult, don't forget to add in that X offset because that offset will change for each launch arm angle. So you'll have a different offset. You only have to measure that for each launch arm angle once, okay? Once you have your data, calculate the average distance traveled. Okay, so you just, if you have 10 data points, add the distances up, divide by 10, simple average. And also record the range. So that's the max distance traveled minus the min distance traveled. Because if we're playing a catapult game and we want to hit the target reliably, and one of our conditions has a spread of 24 inches in the data, we probably don't want to use that condition. If we've got another condition that can get us in the range, 
that maybe the variation is only two to five inches, that's going to be a much better condition to shoot at. So that's what you're going to collect with this next, next set of data. And if you have a spreadsheet like Excel, you can also calculate the standard deviation, which is an even better measurement of the scatter in your data. Finally, how can we use what we learn? Okay. Well, because of the geometry of our catapults, we have slightly different amounts of potential energy stored with each of these lever arm positions. Okay, so the results I showed you assumed constant velocity, and in some cases, the constant Y offset, vertical offset. And that's not what we have with the system. So if you record your elongation for each of your launch arm angles, you'll see that you're actually storing different amounts of potential energy. But we can add additional pencil positions. Uh, and we can also increase the height from which we launch our catapults to get more hang time. So we can use the physics of what we learn to tweak our catapult design and our game. So that's your assignment for next week.